Okay, we have, as usual, the motif of the arrow heading towards the bullseye, trying to hit the bullseye. There are different theories about what's going on when people are making moral choices, and I'm going to address two of the most skeptical theories right now. One of those is psychological egoism, and the other one is ethical egoism. As always, I want to remind you that the focus is on hitting the bullseye of the good, the moral good, the moral right, and the ought, what we ought to do. So, if you remember back to the story of Gyges, when Thrasymachus and Glaucon are speaking to Socrates, they're addressing a very skeptical way of looking at things. They're saying, why are we moral? Why do we do the right thing? Well, because we're afraid of reprisal. We're afraid we'll get caught if we don't. So why be moral? What motivates most of us to be relatively virtuous? Because most humans are relatively virtuous. We have these two theories, psychological egoism and ethical egoism, and I want to just communicate them to you. The first of them intends to address what is, ontology or isness. Psychological egoism, it's the view that all people are selfish in everything they do. The only motive for, from which anyone ever acts is self-interest. So when my wife goes off to work, typically a little bit earlier than I do in the morning, when, we, when we're not in COVID-19 time, or in our normal time, when she goes off to work, I walk her out and carry her bag to the car, and she gets in her car, and I help her to get her seatbelt on because it's way back behind her. And then I tend to, to bend down, and to kiss her. And I will say to her before she goes, before I close the door, I love you. If we were coming from the standpoint of this theory, the idea would be that the only reason I say I love you is to hear her say, what, back? To hear her say, I love you too. My motivation for saying I love you is in order to hear it reciprocated. Now the truth is, is if I said I love you and she said, well, thank you, Bill, that makes me feel good about myself, and then just drove away, I would be a little disappointed. But does that mean that it's just all self when I say I love you? I call this theory the Madonna theory um, because Madonna has made an interesting statement in an interview that I read. She's being interviewed at Cobo Hall out in Detroit at one point in time. She said in that interview, you've never slept with anyone but yourself. What does that mean? It means that all sexual intimacy is mutual usury. We're just using one another. For our own pleasure. That's an extremely pessimistic view of human behaviors and of human moral motivation as well. I personally reject psychological egoism and think that more is going on when we're making ethical choices than that we're just trying to make ourselves happy. Now ethical egoism speaks to normativity or what is or what ought to be required of you. It's the view that no matter how people do in fact behave, they're not obligated to do anything which is not in their own self-interest. I call this theory the least common denominator moral theory, the LCD theory, because it's saying this is the very least that should motivate you to do things. There's got to be something in it for me. If there's nothing in it for me, then I really don't have to do anything. And it still works because, you know, we have this saying, what goes around comes around, or as you sow, so shall you reap. So it makes sense to be nice to somebody or to help somebody because it's probably going to come back to you. But it's a very minimalistic theory as far as what's happening with ethics. So Anne Rand, famous author and famous philosopher, and she's written some well-known books, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and Anthem and a whole, whole lot of other books as well. And she has this book, The Virtue of Selfishness, in which she says, to love is to value only a rationally selfish man. She doesn't mean a male, she means a person. A man of self-esteem is capable of love because he's the only man capable of holding firm, consistent, uncompromising, unbetrayed value. The man who doesn't value himself cannot value anything or anyone. She means you need to love yourself first. And she might be onto something if you think of the person Jesus Christ. One of the things he says is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so there's a presupposition there that there's a degree of self-love that's natural. She says in order to deal with reality successfully, to pursue and achieve the values which his life requires, Man, human beings, need self-esteem. He needs to be confident of his efficacy and worth. I, I do think she's on to something, but I think she's got it just a little bit out of perspective. If I were to address this as far as what the big picture goes, you're troubled here, or you have difficulty with the same issue that you have difficulty with when you try to invest human life with 
value, intrinsic value or worth. The Declaration of Independence was framed in a more religious time and in a culture where it talks about the Creator. And so you have those familiar words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, meaning all people, are created equal and they're endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, amongst which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in a non-religious society, in a secular society, how are we going to underwrite that claim? Where is the, the, the basis for it? What gives it weight? And so Anne Rand's answer to that is, the weight comes from the virtue of selfishness, that if we have a right appraisal of ourselves, we think highly enough of ourselves, then we can be good neighbors and we can uh, be moral people. So going on from there, I would say I think that's perhaps the right concern for us to have, but just slightly off. She's almost got it as far as what's going on ethically or making moral decisions. This is how I would portray her view of things with what she calls the virtue of selfishness. And you can't really make out what that is. Different students have thought that's a bridge or something. You're going to see what it is in a second. But as over against ethical egoism, I'd like you to consider the reasonable, reasonableness of what's called enlightened self-interest. So when you go on an airplane, the flight attendant has this whole talk that most people, if they've flown before, they don't pay that close attention to. One of the things the flight attendant will speak about is if there were a drop in cabin pressure in the plane, there's going to be this mask that's going to drop down from the ceiling. And think about what they say you need to do. Put it on first before you try to help anyone else. Well, why is that? Well, it's because if you don't take care of you, you might not be able to take care of them. It makes sense to take care of yourself first there. And when it comes to say sayings like love your neighbor as you love yourself, you've got to feed yourself, you've got to wash yourself, you've got to exercise, you've got to do things that take good healthy care of yourself for you to be able to function and to interact with other people. So in that sense, there's a selfishness, if you will, that we need, but it's more like self-care. So the idea of enlightened self-interest works a little bit better in my thought process than does the idea of the virtue of selfishness. So here's that picture. This is what the scene is. This is in Campobello Island, uh, up in Canada, and uh, I, we have a place up there, and that's, this has the highest tides in the world. And you can see that's my kayak down by the water, and that's the walkway going down to the kayak. And so I think that by using this illustration, that the idea of the virtue of selfishness gets this picture a little bit fuzzy. We do need to have enlightened self-interest. We do need to love ourselves in the right way in order to be able to love and care for others. But it doesn't mean that we're consumed with selfishness and everything is all a matter of selfishness.